The ancients had their own version of the Guinness Book of World Records. The fastest, the deadliest, and the most valuable objects of antiquity. A land yacht that moved faster than the wind, breaking the world record for speed. A weapon of death so terrifying its own creators banned it from use. A common piece of fruit is converted into a lethal firearm. And the world's first jet engine, produced in ancient Egypt 2,000 years ago. The world's oldest record breakers are our ancient discovery. There are over 600 million automobiles in the world today. We rely on them to meet each day's demands with efficiency and speed. But man's need to create a self-powered vehicle dates back thousands of years. Ancient records describe an economical and environmentally friendly carriage, able to transport passengers faster than horses. Our first record breaker is an ancient vehicle that moved quicker than the Model T Ford, the ancient Chinese land yacht. Can ancient discoveries corroborate these tales? We will build a land yacht and will attempt to beat the ancient land speed record. In about 550 AD, a man called Gaozang Wushu is said to have invented a sailing land yacht which could carry about 30 men at considerable speed for, it's said, hundreds of miles. It was a wheeled vehicle with sails and it was reported that it could travel several hundred li in a day. Now, a li is roughly half a kilometre, so we're looking at distances perhaps of sort of 70 to 100 miles in a day. Ancient Chinese records contain no visual depiction of the vehicle. Nevertheless, there is evidence that the Chinese had for many centuries harnessed the wind for travel on land as well as sea. We know it was fairly commonplace to attach sails to the, the huge single-wheel wheelbarrows which were invented in China probably around about the second century AD. And it was very common for them to actually use these wind assistants to help them move these things. Model maker Richard Windley has designed a land yacht based on the known technology of the time. We don't know whether they based these vehicles on seagoing vessels or whether they were based on carts. It seems quite likely they would have based them on a standard junk sort of design. So effectively that's what we've got, a junk with a sort of standard junk rigging but it would have axles and wheels on it. The junk was common in the rivers and coastal areas of ancient China as it is today. The flat bottom of Chinese ships was especially useful for navigating in shallow waters, particularly the rivers whose water level varied considerably with the seasons. The typical hole shape which is associated with the Chinese junk would obviously be the ideal shape for translation into a land yacht. However, translating the traditional junk design onto a land-based vehicle is far from easy. One of the problems with a reconstruction like this is the classic junk fore and aft rig would require quite a lot of management of the sails and that would be more than one person could deal with. So we've actually simplified this. We're giving it one sail, one mast. We're not all that sure how the, the, the junk rig um, is going to work in terms of efficiency. Before making the sail, the performance of Richard's proposed rigging is tested using a ninth scale model prototype. We've come here today to the wind tunnel at Manchester University, and the object is to find out how it works, whether its performance is effective, and what the most effective sailing rig is going to be. OK, Andrew, we've got a lot of numbers on the screen, but I think some of these are more important than the others. Yeah, I mean, the main ones we're interested in are the thrust, which is moving the yacht along, the side force, which is acting across the yacht, and also the pitching moment, the moment due to the force, which is going to try and dig the, the nose into the ground. Right. So the wind, the wind is doing three different things. What we're looking at is trying to find an optimum sail setting where we get the maximum forward movement, Yeah. A, an acceptable minimum of sideways movement, Yeah. Uh, and not undue pitch. Yeah. Uh, because, obviously, if it's pitching on its nose, 
won't steer. The thing is, if the side force grows too much, then you end up blowing the, the yacht onto its side, so that's something you need to be careful of. The experts reset the position and the angle of the mast and sail several times to discover the best rigging for optimum performance. So with the sail set at a 45 degree angle at 15 degrees yacht from, mm. from the wind, we yeah. seem to have something like an optimum sailing performance. Yeah, I mean the thrust is at its highest position and uh, the side force is getting close to a high, high value as well, so I think that's probably going to be one of, the, one of the best attitudes to actually sail the yacht at. With confidence in the design's effectiveness, work has begun on the full-scale sail. Dick Hannaford has over 30 years' experience in modern and traditional sailmaking. The beauty about the junk sail is that with the battens running across the sail, they're able to control the sail much better than the sails used in, on Western craft. And you can reduce or increase the size of, like you can a Venetian blind. As the wind strength increases or decreases, a pilot adjusts the sail size to control the speed of the craft. This is in a synthetic canvas, which has the feel and the look of a traditional canvas, very similar to the one that the Chinese would be familiar with. The finished build is transported to the sands of Breen Beach on the south coast of England. OK, we're here on the beach. This is the reconstruction of the uh, hypothetical Chinese land yacht. In some ways, it's much more complicated than the boat because there are issues with um, how we attach the mast. Now, we've got quite a lot of flex in the mast, and the mounting of the mast is absolutely critical. On a boat, you've got a lot more depth, so the, ma the mast can be mounted a lot more rigidly. And then the chassis is going to flex, so as the mast waves, the, 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 the actual wood will twist backwards and forwards, and so absorb some of the pressure of the mast, rather than make the whole thing absolutely rigid, which might possibly end up in breakage. In a sense, it's a bit like a very simplified soapbox, but the basic principles are, are really kind of dictated by the physics. The team is joined by Mike Young, a professional racer of modern land yachts. The modern sport started probably after the Second World War. An American newspaper company sponsored uh, building some sand yachts, and they were made of wood. And then the sport has obviously progressed from that type of thing to modern craft like this one. I'm really looking forward to getting in and uh, giving it a try and just putting myself in the position of uh, the old guys that used to obviously, not probably the old guys, they were young guys who were actually sailing it, but in olden times actually sailing that craft. But the team hits an ancient problem. We've got a small technical hitch. The wind has dropped, and there's nowhere near enough wind to conduct the experiment. It's four, the, four miles an hour. It's just gone down three, going down. That's just not enough wind to certainly move this thing anyway. Oh, no. And I would say for this one, with the weight and the size of the sail, we would need 15 to 20 miles an hour. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Well, of course, you're dealing with the wind, which is a natural phenomena, and, I mean, it's variable. It's going to be variable in China 2,000 years ago, the same as it is today. I mean, yeah. they're going to have the same problem, aren't they? We've yeah. actually chosen a rather nice day, haven't we? That's the, that's the problem. It's a lovely day today, <laughs> but not oh. for sailing. <laughs> Just pull the parallel bead through a little bit. Parallel bead. That's great. Okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Just going to tighten it down. That's it. Pull down. Give it a good tug. tug. Right, put a half hitch on it. Finally, wind speed increases. Will the ancient Discovery's land yacht successfully transport our pilot, as Goat Sang's vessel reportedly did some 2,000 years ago? works. We've got the wind behind, the land cart works, we're away. Absolutely brilliant. It's going, which is tremendous. The land yacht could reach a speed of 40 miles per hour, faster than a horse. It would have taken the ancient land speed record. Steering wise, it's very clumbersome and I haven't got quite a turning circle, as I have certainly in mine. Um, but the steering's fine. I mean, it will steer around corners and steer around things. What we've discovered today is that a wind-powered landcraft using ancient technology is perfectly feasible. 
as a, as a form of transport, yes, in, 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 in olden days, yeah, absolutely no problem at all. And free. <laughs> in the sixth century, Chinese engineers using wind for fuel created an effective self-powered vehicle over a thousand years before the advent of modern automobiles. There's more than enough power in the wind to drive a wheeled vehicle along at a reasonable speed over quite long distances. The successful trial of Ancient Discovery's sail cart has confirmed that by adapting the technology of the time to the natural environment, the Chinese could have indeed achieved the world's first self-powered land vehicle. I'm so pleased it actually got going. Some innovations, like the land yacht, are still in use in recognizable form today. Others reached a dead end when no further development was possible. From Africa, Ancient Discoveries has unearthed a device that was so deadly it was deliberately suppressed. The secret of why this was the deadliest knife in history is our next Ancient Discovery. For centuries, the lethal power of this bizarre African weapon has lain dormant in its elaborate blades. Ancient Discoveries is uncovering the lost secrets of the world's deadliest throwing knife. Over 500 years ago, a tribe called the Kuba Bouchon were known as the most ruthless and terrifying warriors of the southern Congo. According to legend, they were armed with a strange and terrifying weapon, the Shongu. The ruling clan of the Kuba people are called the Bouchon which means the people of the lightning, or the people of the shongo, the throwing knife. Records of throwing knives in Africa are sparse. Evidence relies on oral history. What remains a mystery is the fact that most of these objects that we know of today as throwing knives. Only relatively few of them have been documented as being thrown. And, and even fewer still have been actually documented as as weapons of war. Chris Spring is one of the world's leading experts on African throwing knives. The reasons for their use are still kind of shrouded in mystery in many ways. Some we know a bit about, some we know were thrown in particular ritual kind of combats. The vast majority though, we don't know exactly what their real significance, what their real function is. Evidence for the Shongu comes from the explorer Emile Torde, who traveled deep into the Congo to meet the Kuba king at the beginning of the 20th century. Torde only heard the weapon described. He never saw it in action. To test the performance of this strange weapon, ancient discoveries expert and blacksmith Adrian Legg has forged a replica Shongu. The Shongu wasn't actually too bad to make. It was made out of a piece of sheet and actually cut out. And then it was um, work hardened, which is a method by which you actually hammer the material. And that was the way they would have actually toughened it up. Knives like the Shongu were a tribal status symbol and would have been beautifully decorated. These objects would have been extremely personal. I think they would have been decorated um, by the individuals probably with tribal markings. Over a foot in diameter, with five points and 10 blades forged out of hardened steel, it certainly looks lethal. To find out how much damage the Shongu could cause, Ancient Discoveries has enlisted the help of expert knife thrower, John Taylor. Throwing weapons work by literally spinning themselves through the air. You impart the spin into the knife, John has been studying the Shongu to work out how it might have been thrown. My first thought was you actually throw it and then bring it back. However, I soon realized that the spike at the side would hit you in the back. So I suspect this was thrown that way. The Shongu's perfectly balanced aerodynamic shape means that John is able to hit the target with great accuracy. The ingenious engineering and unique positioning of the Shongu's multiple blades gives it a clear advantage over a single-bladed throwing knife. Shongu is in effect three throwing knives in that it can hit either end of these three sharp points. 
If you throw this at anything, except for the small blind spot, if it hits the handle, it will literally injure or kill anyone that's in front of you. The knife could also have been used in hand-to-hand -hand combat. When you were faced with this at about three to four feet from you, the warrior could literally hack, chop, slice the groin, take your head in there, pull you back. It is the Swiss army knife of the African warrior. But John's investigations reveal another, more startling capability of this deadly weapon. A hundred years ago, Emil Torde wrote that the secret of the Shangu's superiority may have been its ability to go around enemy defenses. Torde also speculated that the multiple blades could cause the Shango to bounce over the top of a shield and strike the man hiding behind it. Improbable though it sounds, did these ancient warriors develop a weapon that could get behind an enemy shield? The ancient African legend of a knife that could flip over a shield and impale the man behind it has never been tested before. Until now. A target dummy has been set up with a full-size replica shield protecting it. For the first time, we will test whether the ancient Kuba tale is true. is the knife came over the top of the shield as you can see it's curled around the shield over the top straight into his arm he's out of action it proves that this could hook over a shield the unique shape and positioning of the knife's blades means that when thrown at a precise angle it hooks onto the enemy shield and continues spinning taking it over the shield and into an opponent to face this in a battle would have been a terrifying experience. There would have been numerous knives being thrown at you. You would literally be hiding behind a shield, but these could come round the side at any oblique angle. Over 500 years ago, the Kuba Bouchong invented an amazing weapon that could get behind an enemy's defense. It was the deadliest throwing knife of its time. It may not have happened every time, but certainly it could have carried out this sort of attack often enough to cause terror in the ranks of an opponent. Tales told of this deadly blade have been proved right. It's not often that we make a new discovery about weapons that have been around for hundreds of years. But when it does happen, it can give us an entire new insight into ancient history. The Shanggu proved so lethal a weapon that in the 17th century, it was banned by the king of the Kuba. It's perhaps because he deemed it the most ferocious kind of weapon that they had. And therefore, in order to stop kind of possible violence erupting in his kingdom, he banned it as opposed to the use of swords or spears or other more conventional weapons. This deadliest of throwing knives disappeared into African legend, along with the knowledge of its extraordinary capabilities, until today. Our next ancient record breaker is a primitive weapon that started a process of development that changed the world of warfare. We have tracked down the ancient world's deadliest fruit. Not a poison, but a firearm. It was a simple fruit that, with the addition of human ingenuity, can lay claim to being one of the world's first guns. How do you turn market produce into a weapon? In our next discovery from the ancient world, we reveal history's deadliest fruit. In the 10th century AD, the Chinese put gunpowder and weapons together for the first time and created a revolution in warfare. The Chinese introduction of gunpowder weapons in about the 10th century marked a revolutionary change in warfare. It was the first time in history that chemical energy had been harnessed to do any kind of work. It led to 
a lot of the technological innovations that have produced the modern world, including rocketry and eventually the internal combustion engine. The Chinese experimented with a variety of gunpowder weapons. In the 15th century, they created the oddest of all, a gun made out of a bottle gourd. One example of Chinese ingenuity, which we know about from slightly later, was the gourd gun. An ordinary bottle gourd, such as grows in the garden and can actually be eaten, was hollowed out and used as a container for gunpowder and to propel projectiles out of the end. Incredibly, the gourd gun became a common feature of the ancient Chinese arsenal. We know that they were made and stockpiled, and although we don't hear of the specific use in any particular battle, there can be little doubt that they were used especially in sieges, perhaps to, to throw from the walls or as short-range flamethrowers to deter an attacker. But how was this piece of dry fruit turned into a gun? Richard Windley is recreating this unlikely weapon to find out. Well, this object I've got here is a bottle gourd. And these grew widely all over China, and they were used for an incredible range of different purposes. Once these are dried and hollowed out, it gives us a lovely vessel. They're quite hard um, and strong, and they were used for water carriers, for putting kind of powdered materials, for grain, all sorts of things. And one of the early weapons um, that were produced with these things were called um, hulu gourd guns or projectors. And they would be filled with some kind of gunpowder mixture, which probably contained some sort of projectile maybe little bits of stone, they may have been bits of grit or sand, or they could have even been small pebbles or even small pieces of lead or scrap metal. And the idea was that this material would burn fairly quickly. This is like a natural nozzle, the neck of the vessel, so this would produce a kind of fountain effect. And the idea was that the projectiles would be thrown out at quite considerable speed along with a spurt of flame. But there was a fundamental drawback with the simple gourd. Now, obviously, the gourd is an organic material, and the, the high temperatures generated by these gunpowder compounds burning it is probably going to char or even burn right through this, so we're going to have a problem. To show us how the bottle gourd was adapted for pyrotechnics, Richard has cut his prototypes in half. Now, the texts do indicate that they use clay, and it talks about a coating. So this is one variation that I've constructed, and this is a slurry of clay made into sort of like a sort of creamy consistency, poured all around the inside of the gourd and then dried. This would give some kind of refractory coating on the inside, which would prevent the gourd from burning through. It might still char the, 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 the material of the gourd a little bit, but it's like a kind of barrier between the intense heat of the gunpowder and the kind of organic material that the gourd is made from. This solves the problem of combustion burning through the material. However, there is another crucial issue. My concern with the, the simple clay lined gourd is that because of these sort of intense pressures we're going to get generated with these um, gunpowder compositions, um, and particularly because we've got a nozzle which is restricting the outflow of the gases, we're going to get quite a big buildup of gas pressure. So my concern is that these things will explode. Gunpowder works by burning or oxidizing extremely rapidly. Firing, give him fire! This causes a violent expansion of gases, creating an explosion. This energy can be harnessed in a number of ways. An explosion can simply blow apart whatever the gunpowder was contained in. For example, a firework or a bomb. Or the energy can be channeled in a specific direction. In the internal combustion engine of an automobile, tiny explosions drive pistons, just as a bigger explosion propels a bullet or a cannonball out of a gun barrel. The force produced by a continuous explosion can push something forward, as in a jet engine. Richard is concerned that the expanding gases in the gourd will not be able to escape through the narrow neck and with nowhere to go, will simply blow the gourd apart. What engineering solution could the ancient Chinese have found for this fundamental problem? As an alternative, I've come up with another system whereby the gourd is almost entirely filled uh, with like a sort of solid material 
the gourd then will constrain this material. The whole thing will be very strong. It also has the benefit of leaving us with a cylindrical hole down the middle of the gourd, which is incredibly useful in terms of ramming the gunpowder because this means we can compact it, we can slow down the burn rate, we can incorporate different sorts of projectiles into it. Based on the ancient Chinese texts, Richard has built working models of these two versions of the gourd gun. What we need to do now is to load these with a composition and take them to a secure site and test them and see how the two different methods compare. Richard has come to our secure testing grounds to fire the gourd guns. Can Richard discover whether they would have been effective on an ancient battlefield? First, he will test the gourd, which has been simply lined with clay. OK, so what I've got here is the first variation of the gourd. This is the one where we've got a thin clay lining on the inside of the gourd. It's been like a slurry applied to it and then dried. And we're hoping this will act as a refractory material, which will prevent the gourd from burning. However, I'm really quite concerned about this one in terms of its performance, because we can't ram the pyrotechnic mixture. So unless they were using a very, very slow kind of gunpowder or mixture, um, there's a fair chance that this could explode. All clear? Will the gourd and its thin lining of clay contain the force of the gunpowder? Or will it explode, as Richard predicts? Well, I think I was right in the assumption that we might well get a big bang if this pyrotechnic mixture wasn't compacted enough. And there's no point in taking out your own personnel. It's a self-defeating piece of equipment if that happens. So I think we need to go on to plan B and we'll try the other method where we, we've left a cylindrical hole down the gourd and we've been able to ram the powder to compact it to slow down the burn rate. And hopefully we'll get a similar amount of energy to the explosion, but we'll get a prolonged period of time over 20 or 30, maybe seconds if we're lucky, rather than just that one sudden bang. Will the second version of the gourd gun have any range or direction? The second gourd gun creates an impressive fountain of exploding gunpowder. If there were projectiles in the mix, the enemy would be faced with a volley of primitive shrapnel. Now these wouldn't have come out at very high velocity, but they could still do damage, they could still blind people. So these would have been very, very nasty. Richard has discovered that the gourd gun can be easily handled. Ancient Chinese commanders would have been able to equip entire armies with these primitive handguns. You wouldn't want that plume of flame coming at you if you were trying to scale, say, the walls of a fortification of a castle and you were just getting to the top of the ramparts and suddenly a whole spurt of this flame came at you, you wouldn't want to be there. So in, in terms of defensive weapons, they were probably very effective. And of course on the battlefield, the whole troop of people wielding these things would quickly make inroads into the enemy ranks. With a few simple modifications, the gourd was turned into a cheap and effective fighting tool and became one of the forerunners of the modern gun. In a sense, you could say that the gourd was the first step on the way to the gun. It's fairly rudimentary and it is still more related to a firework than the gun proper. But you can see the genesis of the gun in the fire gourds. The gourd gun has moved on, but some chemical discoveries are still with us. The most expensive commodity in the ancient world, it is still the most expensive today. More than gold, platinum, or even diamonds. Tyrian purple was a pigment made to dye the clothes of Roman emperors. It was made from old shellfish, and it costs over $50,000 for one single ounce. The world has always contained treasured objects, from the beautiful to the sacred. In Egypt, the brilliant treasures of the pharaohs still glitter after 3,000 years. From ancient Greece, the solid gold death mask of the great warrior king Agamemnon has lost none of its shine. In ancient temples, mausoleums, and palaces, we have discovered treasures beyond imagination. But what is the most valuable? What was the most expensive, most desired, most precious treasure in the ancient world? The ancient world has given us many treasures, perhaps most surprising of all, that if we want to find the most valuable thing, we need to look under our feet on the seashore for a small, stinky sea snail that gave us Tyrian purple. 
Tyrian Purple is named after the ancient city of Tyre in the eastern Mediterranean. The Tyrians discovered a natural fabric dye that became the most desirable luxury in the Roman world. Tyrian purple was the most expensive commodity the Roman Empire knew. Something, in modern day terms, the equivalent of $2,000 per gram. That meant that it was certainly not available to everyone. In fact, only the richest could afford even the smallest amount of it. The color was coveted with a passion by the ruling classes of Rome. Clothes dyed with the color proclaimed power and wealth. The price of a single gram is $2,000, equal to the cost of almost four ounces of solid gold today. Tyrian purple was such an important commodity for the Emperor Nero that, according to Suetonius, he banned anyone else from wearing it. Tyrian purple is made from a sea snail, a small mollusk that you find along the shores of the Mediterranean. But how can a small common shellfish be so expensive? The answer lies in the complicated and time-consuming process necessary to convert the mollusk into dye. This will give very little purple. You need 10,000, 12,000 for 1.4 gram of colorant. The formulas and the manufacturing technology were lost for centuries. Tyrian purple was a complex thing to make. And so the real specialists, the experts, would have kept their processes, their styles of making that color close to their hearts, a secret which they would have taken with them to the grave. And so the secret of how to make this color has been lost for many, many centuries. Too often, Academics studying aspects of the ancient world will sit in the library and rely on what the texts tell them. We have to recreate the processes that they went through. And in doing that, we can understand exactly why this purple was of such value to the ancient world. Ancient Discoveries has traveled to Provence in the south of France, one of the heartlands of the Roman Empire, to rediscover the secret of how to make the most valuable commodity in history. Inga Boskin Canold is an artist specializing in ancient dyes and pigments. Through close study of ancient European texts and years of trial and error, she has rediscovered this mysterious and forgotten process. Inga's first step is to acquire a type of shellfish called a murex trunculus. It is not a common seafood, but is occasionally cooked and eaten in France and Italy. It can be bought at a simple fish stall for $20 a pound. She begins the laborious task of cracking open the shells one by one. For our experiment, Inga will crush over nine pounds of murex to dye just one small piece of wool. But where does the purple color come from? At first glance, the flesh of the murex is white in color with no trace of purple. The answer lies in the colorless liquid secreted from a gland inside the shell that must be removed from each individual snail. This is the hypobranchial gland, the purple veil, which will produce the color. I cut it out with all the rest around, and I put it in a plate. The glands Inga cuts out are initially colorless, but they react to oxygen and light so the process of creating Tyrian purple begins. The laborious process has to be done by hand. The smallest trace of dye is so valuable that Inga puts the leftover water from the broken shells into the jar to make sure that not a milligram is wasted. After days of scraping out the shells, the result is a jar of rich, deep purple liquid. If I dip cloth into this, the cloth will be just dirty looking and there is no stable purple on it. Another naturally occurring chemical is needed to bind with the color and fix it to the fabric, human urine. Over the next 10 days, Inga heats the mixture in a boiler at approximately 50 degrees. She adds urine until the right alkaline level is achieved. But how would the ancients have known when the purple dye was ready? By smelling it? by licking it, tasting it, and by looking at it. There are signs which will show that. It's all the senses which are used in order to know. They didn't need this. 
Inga constantly monitors the solution for 10 days, just as the ancients did. Will she succeed in creating the dye that was used to color the robes of the wealthiest sections of society? Purple became the color for the nouveau riche, the people, the movers and shakers who wanted to show that they were part of the top, top class of Roman society. It was the ancient equivalent of Gucci or Prada. But just as Rolex and Prada have to contend with fakes today, ancient dyers were victims of counterfeiters. As time goes on, fakes start to emerge from animal fats, from vegetables, from minerals. So real purple had to try and guard its value against the fakes of the ancient world. How did Roman high society know they were getting the real thing? The answer once again lies in its fishy origins, and it isn't very pleasant. The color purple wasn't just a color, it had a smell attached to it. And in fact, some of the sources describe it as one of the four most foul smells of the ancient world. And so we're left with a quandary. Why this most expensive, luxurious color that only emperors would wear at certain times would also have this smell that was so repulsive. But that smell, however bad it might be, was associated with the luxury of the color. And so though it may have smelt bad, it looked damn good. Back in Provence, 10 days have passed and the vat is ready. Now Inga can discover whether she has succeeded in making the most expensive commodity yet known to man. Our wool sample must be dipped in the dye several times. According to Pliny, you should leave it at least five hours, but I leave it overnight. And usually I have good results after three times dyeing. To make a batch of color to dye a modest garment requires thousands of murex shells. The same piece of textile must be dipped again and again to achieve the desired shade of purple. An extraordinary number of these little sea creatures must have been sacrificed to clothe in style the most powerful and wealthy of Rome. Even by following the precise formula, there is no guarantee that we will create the right shade of purple dye we're looking for. Once the wool is out of the active vat, it goes into water, and after about half an hour, it should be ready. Now we'll see whether the vat was active and effective. Let's see. And here we are. It is purple. In recreating this complex manufacturing process, Ancient Discoveries has produced enough purple dye to color two grams of natural wool. The Romans spent a fortune on purple because it was beautiful and proclaimed wealth. Despite its foul odor, the ancients embraced it as the greatest symbol of high status. Our next discovery was also a luxury item. Originally, it was used for entertainment, a mechanical plaything but it would initiate a technological revolution using principles of physics that led to the development of today's jet engine. Ancient Discoveries has uncovered a groundbreaking mechanical device that was invented over 2,000 years ago. It was the first example in history of a machine that today powers our planes and takes us into space, the jet engine. The jet engine is the symbol of the modern age because it's the principal power plant for commercial, military aviation and spacecraft. The prototype of this technological masterpiece was invented in the first century AD, 2,000 years ago. It ran on steam, a power source not exploited again until the Industrial Revolution of the modern era. Our journey begins in the city of Alexandria in ancient Egypt. Alexandria was a very special place in ancient times. It was a hotbed of activity for scientists and engineers. The sort of people that were attracted there were the great thinkers of the time. It was a center of innovation and learning, containing the largest library of the ancient world and home to many of the greatest minds of antiquity. 
one of them was an engineer by the name of Heron. Alexandria attracted men like Heron, one of the most famous engineers of ancient times. Heron was considered the greatest experimenter of history. He was responsible for many of the most celebrated inventions of the ancient world. He laid the basis for the science of pneumatics, in other words, the action of air under pressure. He was one of the first people in Western history to understand that air was a physical substance that could be harnessed to exert a force. In one of his experiments, he designed a toy that demonstrated this insight. It was far more than a party trick. Heron had created the prototype of a machine that has changed our world today. Heron called it the Eliopile, the ball of Helios, the Greek god of the wind. Following closely Heron's original drawings, ancient model maker Richard Windley has reconstructed the Eliopile. The machine is powered by steam. Water is heated in a boiler, creating steam that is forced through the copper pipes that support the engine. So what's happening now is the, the heat from the fire is generated in the steam. The steam is coming up this tube here and coming out of each of the nozzles. Now the action of the steam projecting out of the nozzle is producing a force equal and opposite in the other direction, which is what's actually giving us the rotational force. It's a wonderfully simple but elegant device. Elegant and simple as it is, Heron's device is the forerunner of the intricate piece of machinery that is the jet engine. How did Heron's Heliopile evolve into one of the world's most powerful machines? The key is in the scientific principle which underlies both groundbreaking inventions. A principle first described by the physicist Isaac Newton in 1687. He called it his third law of motion. Newton's third law of motion is for every reaction, there's an equal and opposite reaction. It is this principle that underlies the physics behind jet propulsion. Heron used it to power his aliopile. In the aliopile, heat underneath the boiler causes water molecules to vibrate and expand into the gas we call steam. Expansion creates pressure. Under pressure, the steam has nowhere to go but up the pipes and out of the tiny hole in the nozzles. The force of the exhaust creates an equal and opposite reaction, which drives the nozzle forwards. The aliopile was free to rotate, so as jet force was escaping from the sphere, then the reactant force was capable of rotating the sphere around its supports. The same principle applies to a jet. It is an internal combustion engine powering a turbine that compresses air and forces it out of a nozzle at the back. This drives the machine forward in exactly the same way as Heron's device. This principal mechanism is to uh, take an air fuel mix and accelerate that by burning it through a nozzle. And by sending that through a nozzle, we create a force or a thrust, which is the principle of jet propulsion. The use of a jet of gas to propel an object is the same principle that applies to the modern jet engine, first designed by inventor Frank Whittle in the 1930s. Frank Whittle was the first person to actually patent the first design jet engine. We can only imagine what Heron of Alexandria would have felt if he knew that his invention was the forerunner of a machine that in a later age would change the world. We take a power plant of this size, which is capable of producing lots of force, and if we attach that to the wing of an aircraft, then the reaction force from rearward will propel the aircraft forward. The physical laws discovered by Heron over 2,000 years ago continue to inform engineers working at the forefront of jet engine technology today. Heron's Heliopile remained a scientific curiosity for 2,000 years. What other ancient discoveries will be exploited by engineers in our modern world. As we consider the technological advances of the present, we acknowledge the debt we owe to the past. From the world's most expensive luxury to the first jet engines, 
the accomplishments of the ancient world's record breakers continue to challenge our own imagination and ingenuity.